Uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you that we are a little bit behind schedule, and I, that, I suppose that's nothing new to any of you, or it's not a surprise. Uh, however, we will have our speakers uh, run the full term because we think that is important for the conference, and we've arranged it so there is extensive time for lunch, and uh, we feel that we will be able to uh, give you the uh, conference that we promised to you. Uh, I'm going to pour myself a drink here. Strictly non-alcoholic. <laughs> Mind Control and People Control, The Technology of Psychological Warfare. From Cine Fantastique magazine, a description of Anthony Schaefer's protagonist in the film The Wicker Man, quote, tearing around in dizzying circles trying to solve it, never able to guess the true plot beyond it, although the evidence of it lies all around him. From J. H. Towson's book, Clowns. As the huckster delivered his harangue, the clown would repeatedly poke his head behind the curtain, making fun of everything his master said, parodying his patter, and twisting the meaning of his words. The huckster played the perfect straight man, meanwhile. Here he was trying so hard to hawk his wares and his own assistant was doing everything possible to undermine sales. The merriment was, of course, intentional. While the clown seemingly encouraged the public not to buy the proffered merchandise, the huckster knew full well that the bystanders would be easily converted into customers as soon as they forgot that they were, indeed, to be buying. Once the audience had been effectively hypnotized, once its judgment and willpower had been weakened, the real sales pitch could begin. Charles Fort, quote, almost all people of all eras are hypnotics. Their beliefs are induced beliefs. The proper authorities saw to it that the proper belief should be induced, and people believed properly. One final quote from banker J.P. Morgan, for every action, there are two reasons, a good reason and the real reason. In a study of mind control and psychological warfare, it is not enough to simply review the latest technology of coercion, the most recent gadgetry and techno junk littering the hardware and supply depots of governments and cults. Far more dangerous than these appliances is the praxis behind them the underground current which informs the modern project and this era. Life in our modern era being little more than life in an open air mind control laboratory where a form of human alchemy has emerged to transform the mass of targeted percipients, targeted merely by virtue of their being urban dwellers plugged into the electronic and digital pageantry of the establishment's system of things. And what sort of creature is it that inhabits such a domain? Who is the modern man? The puppet masters say that he is the smartest, most advanced individual to ever strut the planet, the most relatively liberated being in history. But Louis Ferdinand Céline, the great French novelist, said it well. What does the modern public want? It wants to go down on its knees before money and before detritus. The public have been trained to do this by two principal methods, direct speaking archetypal messages of pure terror, very similar, similar to the experiments of Dr. Ewan Cameron of McGill University's Allen Memorial Clinic, which he described as psychic driving, these being encoded in certain massively publicized lone nut mass murders, and by the sinister flattery heaped upon the modern public by their masters in the cult of progress and optimism. The acid test of a human being's freedom and will to protect the quality of life lies in a person's attitude toward their oppressors. What is modern man's attitude toward Wall Street and the big bankers, toward Dan Rather and the ignorance-bestowing media and advertising man, 
toward Wilson and FDR and Reagan and the politicians who waste their sons in bankers' wars. As one writer has observed, the most amazing thing about the American people is that they are constantly defending their betrayers. Who then is the modern man? He is a mind-bombed patsy who gets his marching orders from twilight language key words sprinkled throughout his news and current events so that even as he dances to the tune of the elite managers of human behavior, he scoffs with great derision at the idea of the existence and operation of a technology of mass mind control. Modern man is much too smart to believe anything as superstitious as that. Modern man is, in fact, the ideal hypnotic subject. Puffed up on the idea that he is the crown of creation, he vehemently denies the power of the hypnotist's hold over him even as his head bobs up and down on a string. Mind control attempts to achieve within the percipient three destructive conditions, amnesia, or loss of memory, abulia, or loss of will, and apathy, or loss of interest in events vital to one's own health and survival. Amnesia, abulia, and apathy are universal in Western society and gaining a greater foothold with each day. I doubt any medieval peasant would have much difficulty in feeling a sense of foreboding and even terror in the face of the Soviet hammer and sickle symbol. Yet some modern literate people obviously don't know a thing about what that symbol represents except on the most profane level as the implements of the farmer and the worker. In actuality, the sickle symbol represents Saturn and has for thousands of years, also known as Chrono-Saturn, or as the Greeks called him, Demiurgus, the operating engineer of the universe, as opposed to the creator of that universe. In the reign of Saturn, we see exorbitant building and modeling activities, and this is reflected in the Masonic reference to their god as the big builder or architect. Well, this sounds pretty good. We all like buildings and modeling activities, nice projects along those lines, but as usual, there is more to it than that because this Saturnian Masonic building is building against the grain, against the natural order. You need Saturn and his architecture after Eden, after Saturn had separated the unity of heaven and earth by means of that fateful sickle. So what do we have behind the cover story about a worker's paradise in the Soviet Union? We have the sickle, the very symbol of the bisection of heaven and earth and the destruction of paradise by material and temporal decay. In other words, we have a grotesque mockery of the very principle touted. This macabre arrogance borders on the clownish for those initiates or self-initiates who have the understanding to see it. And I submit to you that it is this mockery which builds the psychological power of the cryptocracy. Let's explore this mocking deception further. There are essentially two forces seeking to tyrannize and control us. The first force represents the orthodoxy of altar and throne, reaction and conformity. As modern people, we have been raised to believe that it is from this direction, from the ancien regime of the old political spectrum, that we can expect to encounter the greatest threat to liberty. Actually, this is only a secondary threat. It is not the main threat for no other reason than the fact that we have our guard up against it. We expect that a threat will come from monarchies, presidents, Protestant orthodoxies, Catholic orthodoxies, but obviously the greatest potential threat can come from the unsuspected direction, from the force that is misidentified and masked, and that force which is, presents itself as fascism with a human face. If there is one thing we can say about the tyrants of church and throne, of tradition and property and reaction, it is that they rarely come to us in disguise. Their ceremonies are often vainglorious and pompous, but the core of their belief system, a credo they do not hide from their subjects, is the bad news about human nature. Louis Ferdinand Céline wrote, and I quote, since the end of religions, before this new modern altar, they have been swinging incense they have been intoxicating modern man with a sense of his own importance, with all manner of rigmarole. Man has been made the whole church, 
No longer can he see anything with clear eyes. He is cracked. He believes anything that is told to him just as long as it is flattering to him. And Selene continues, the practical superiority of the great Christian religions was that they did not try to sugarcoat the pill. They did not try to throw dust in the eyes. They were not looking for voters. They never felt the need to wiggle their tails in an effort to please. They never felt the need of ingratiating themselves. They just seized man in his cradle and broke the bad news to him without reservation. They told him, you little shapeless stinker you, you can never be anything but dirt, from dust thou art. By birth you are nothing but merd. Do you hear me, you? That's the evidence, that's the principle of everything. However, these church fathers went on, maybe, maybe in scrutinizing the matter more closely, you have got one little chance of winning a bit of pardon for being as you are, so filthy, so excremental, so unbelievable. And that is if you can hold your chin up in the face of all the sorrows, all the afflictions, all the ordeals, miseries and tortures you will have to face in this life during your lifetime, whether it be long or short, but always with perfect humility. Life, you louse, is just one long bitter ordeal. Don't get out of breath. Don't expect noon to come at two o'clock. Just try to save your soul. That's something in itself. Maybe at the end of this Calvary of yours, if you get to be a regular fellow, a hero in keeping your trap shut, you may be saved by these principles. But even then, that's not a sure thing. Watch your step. Don't speculate on first and last things. For you, that is the maximum. And Celine concludes, that was seriously spoken by real church fathers who knew the tools of their trade and did not try to do tricks with mirrors. We can see from Celine's colorful prose that 20th century populism and 20th century conservatism are actually thoroughly modern and are really bridges toward the mocking deception, toward that tyranny that we have been taught to actually revere as the source of our liberation. Conservatism and populism are based on the same notion of statecraft as the second force I'm about to outline, predicated upon the flattery of mass man and human nature in order to obtain votes. So at the opposite extreme from the church and the throne, we have the philosophy that describes itself as the right of perfection. This is the alternate term for the Scottish rite of Freemasonry, the most powerful Masonic order in the world. This is the occult philosophy of not just the Novus Ordu Seclorum, the so-called new order of the ages, but also of the Elizabethan age and long before it. This is the intellectual conceit that the universe, natural creation, is going to be perfected by the godlike intervention of the human intellect. This is the philosophy behind the entire occult project which first came to the fore in Europe with the Renaissance. And it is true, as Francis Yates writes, that, quote, it was in its origins that the occult philosophy of the Renaissance had inspired some of the most exquisite productions of Renaissance culture. In other words, in the majestic incense of Renaissance art, there is also the whiff of the sulfurous. This malodorous current emerged with greater force in Rabelais' Abbey of Thelim, or Thelima, the philosopher's paradise, where there was but one rule, fakis qui se voudra, or do what you want. Look at the mocking arrogance behind this claim of Rabelais. He, like his occult forebearers, is a Saturnian, a follower of the scythe wielder, who is an allegory the first to have chopped and disconnected the unity between heaven and earth. But now Rabelais comes forward as a spokesman for Renaissance enlightenment, offering us a utopia. If Chrono Saturn destroyed a divine Eden, Saturn being the force of time, decay, and the progress of matter, or the second law of thermodynamics, man will recreate a true Thelema, a better heaven than God, right here on earth. And that, in sum, is the cover story that maintains cachet for this other force opposed to altar and throne to this day. It is between two ideologies that we have been pulled in Western history, between the monumental autocracy of the church, the monarchy, reaction, and folk tradition at one end, and the alleged anarcho-libertarian, Gnostic, Masonic, heresiarchs at the other, who only want freedom 
and love and toleration for all of us. Robert K.G. Temple is one of their better propagandists, and I quote, the platonic tradition in the broader sense with its Gnostic and heretical overtones and its myriad manifestations in later ages in such bizarre and fascinating figures as Giordano Bruno, Marsilio Ficino, and John Dee, not to mention the troubadours of Provence and the massacred tens of thousands of Albigensians in France, the Knights Templar, and an infinite range of hopeless causes over two and a half millennia. Platonism in the general sense is a creed which denies creed, an anti-institutional tradition. It insists on nothing by way of doctrinal dogma. It is truly free. It has no pope. And it terrifies those weaker mentalities which crave a shuttered belief system. They always try to destroy it, but succeed only in destroying individuals and individual movements within the larger tradition. End quote from Robert K.G. Temple. Well, Temple has given us a classic statement of the standard propaganda front for this force. It's rather incredible to ponder the depth of deception residing inside those few paragraphs of his. We observe, first of all, a martyr martyrology and a victimhood established. The persecuted freedom lovers, massacred, hounded, destroyed. Implicit in that ridiculously one-sided caricature is the notion of blamelessness, nonviolence, and toleration on the part of this exalted academy. Well, no one would guess from Temple's propaganda that his heroes, among whom he numbers the Knights Templar, were directly responsible for unleashing one of the most insidious plagues upon Western civilization, a plague countless reformers have given their lives to attempt to overthrow. Historian Desmond Seward, writing in The Monks of War, cites as the Knights Templar's most lasting achievement, quote, their contribution to the overthrow of the church's attitude toward usury. No medieval institution did more for the rise of capitalism. This was the Knights Templars who, far from being anti-institutional, were actually the prototype of the first international bankers. Their first respectable Shylocks who made extracting a pound of flesh at interest the enlightened thing to do. Temple also cites as heroes the Albigensians, those paradigms of the liberated spirit in opposition to the church. Well, it's quite true, according to the historical record, the Albigensians were horribly repressed with great cruelty. But that fact alone must not blind us to the fact of what the Albigensians represented. One of the classic examples of hierarchical viciousness and hypocrisy and priestcraft after the Catholic Church itself. The Albigensians swore hostility against the God of the Old Testament and the whole of the material world. At least that was their propaganda cover story. Hence, the rank and file Albigensian was sworn to live a life of celibacy and asceticism, the better to avoid entanglements in matter and flesh. But here's the catch. There was a second class within the Albigensian religion, a ruling class or a priest class, known as the perfecti. Now these perfecti, or perfect ones, were supposed to practice all the austerities of the rank and file Albigensians and then take those austerities to an even more extreme degree in what was supposed to be a life led as a perpetual Lent. But as with most organizations and, with, and as with imperfect, flawed human nature always, there was a secret side to the perfecti class which they chose not to reveal to the imperfect class. Since this priest class was perfect, they were above the law. And therefore, the perfecti in reality practiced all forms of bodily pleasure and debauch with abandon. The Gnostic Masonic free-thinking victims, as Temple styles them, and it's not just Temple who depicts them in this way, everyone from Gary Snyder to Robert Anton Wilson to Manley Palmer Hall, and most of the intellectual establishment of our day share in his assessment. These poor, persecuted victims assassinated anyone who got in their way. One of the most brilliant and tenacious of their opponents was the Elizabethan playwright Christopher Marlowe, whose play Dr. Faustus was a stunningly devastating attack on the Rosicrucian cryptocracy. Mortar, 
Marlowe was murdered by them, stabbed in the eye for his trouble. How different a picture history gives us of these alleged neoplatonic rebels for tolerance and freedom and no pope and no dogma. In reality, the Thelemic Current, the Do Your Own Thing Academy, is in fact a counter church with rules far more rigid than even the church system that is their arrival for power and pelf. For the counter church has one thing the church no longer retained, the patina of persecution, the advertisement of free thought, no rules, freedom, kick out the jams, and beneath that, a profound secrecy about their genuine objectives. Churchianity's dogmatic propaganda has been that God is on its side. The propaganda of the Sanhedrin, of the Masonic libertarian cryptocracy, has been that it will make every man God. And in liberty, equality, and fraternity will their collective godhood reign. But as George Orwell stated in his anti-utopian masterpiece, Animal Farm, some are more equal than others in such utopias. Returning now to our original question of which is more dangerous a threat to individual autonomy and natural order, the threat from the tragicomic opera generals, kings, and churchmen who make no secret of their pretensions to glory and rule and the desire to dominate, or those other generals, kings, and tyrants who advance their rule under the mask of free thought, victimhood, equality, and heaven on earth. I submit that the greater threat emanates from the latter and has ever since the Renaissance. Under cover of all this finery, this exquisite liberal humanitarian enlightenment has come a tyranny so immense it is difficult to grasp, a physical, technological tyranny as well as a tyranny of the mind. In the beginning, this horror was dressed up in the de la haute majesty of the Renaissance. Then the alchemical programming of humanity and that, after all, is always what alchemy has really been about, the talk of baser metals and so forth being a code phrase for base humanity. The process, this intricate and delicate theater of the thanatos, this hermetic shepherding of the sheeple, all for our own good and parenthetically without our knowledge, took place inside the flowering of the greatest art epic in our civilization. I'm reminded of the French nobleman René d'Anjou, who was also a Gnostic magus, who in 1449 at the court of Tarascon staged a series of pas de armes, curious hybrid amalgams of tournament and mask, in which knights went through the motions of tilting at each other, and at the same time performed a mysterious species of play or drama, the plot and end of which was never entirely clear. These beautifully crafted and staged plays were actually a form of psychodrama. Those who watched or partook of the ceremony were subtly influenced by these dramatic rituals. Nowadays, the engineering of the mind and the transformation of humanity is not quite as edifying or nearly as artistic. The contemporary program, programming of humanity is now accomplished by means of cheap dialogue and scenery as mundane and mediocre as magazine advertisements for whiskey, as Dr. Wilson Brian Key has documented in his book Subliminal Seduction, whereby the horrid figures of the dance macabre are scattered microscopically in ice cubes inside whiskey ads. The conscious mind doesn't perceive these, but the subconscious does. Or we can cite the plethora of extremely violent and simultaneously symbolical popular films of the modern cinema like The Wicker Man and Videodrome, which in a very coarse and crude manner, in comparison with the occult mystery plays of the Renaissance, continue this brainwashing and programming process. The issue of ceremonial and subliminal films, by the way, was raised at length in Philip K. Dick's masterful novel, Vallis, which I recommend to you. I should point out a fallacy at this juncture, which has currency among those heretics who dissent from both churchianity and all aristocracies, save the natural aristocracy, and but who also grasp the more egregious tyranny and mind napping that lurks behind the facade of the liberal radical revolutionary operation. This fallacy of even these independent investigators is that exposure per se 
of the methods and personnel involved in the cryptocracy's crimes is an ultimate goal. If only we could get some of these facts out into the open, runs the refrain. Well, I would reply to that notion that the cryptocracy is not stagnant. It is engaged in a remarkable process set into motion centuries ago, an operation which has accomplished most, if not all, of its chief goals with awe-inspiring dispatch already. In the beginning and middle stages of this operation, secrecy was a key to accomplishing these goals. Generally speaking, that secrecy is no longer necessary today. Quite the contrary. The cryptocracy has actually been determined to reveal many of its greatest secrets to we profane ones for some time now, but very few have noticed. Researchers were astonished at the wealth of material about the Gnostic Masonic occult cryptocracy, which appeared in the 1970s in two crucially important books. Kenneth Grant's The Magical Revival, excuse me, check that, three important books. Kenneth Grant's The Magical Revival, and also by the same author, the book Aleister Crowley and the Hidden God, as well as the aforementioned Robert K.G. Temple's book, The Serious, and that's spelled S-I-R-I-U-S, The Serious Mystery. These three works, revealing secrets of the highest magnitude, which had been vigorously protected and hidden upon pain of death for centuries, and in the case of Temple's book, Millennia, were published with the knowledge and approval of the heirs to this knowledge. A book almost as important, the late Stephen Knight's Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, was published under similar circumstances, but without the complete approval, in my view, of the establishment, who had some minor objections to certain portions of it. Nevertheless, the English monarchy gave Mr. Knight special access to certain key papers, which weren't supposed to be opened for several decades. And from these and his own brilliant investigative reporting, he marshaled very compelling evidence that the Ripper was none other than the royal physician to Her Majesty Queen Victoria, Sir William Gull, directly aided and abetted by two of England's highest police officials, Sir Charles Warren and Sir Robert Anderson. All three of these criminals were Freemasons of the highest rank. In fact, Warren was the founder of the research and intelligence arm of modern masonry, the Ars Quator Coronatorum Lodge. You will also see a process of episodic revelations repeated time and again in these notorious lone nut assassination series. And in masonry, the lone nut is referred to uh, in a triumvirate as the three unworthy craftsmen. The assassination of John F. Kennedy by lone nut, Lee Harvey Oswald. The assassination of Martin Luther King by lone nut, Earl Ray and the assassination of Bobby Kennedy by lone nut, Sirhan Sirhan. In each case, at the time of the murders, both the media and the police conspire to present a united and seemingly infallible solution to these crimes, centering on allegedly ironclad and overwhelmingly irrefutable evidence that Oswald or Sirhan or Ray were the sole perpetrators of these electrifying crimes which galvanize the nation. Then, in accordance with the clockwork script, five or 10 or 15 years later, after the trail is hopelessly obscured and cold, a spate of tightly documented and well-researched books emerge which turn our heads 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Now we are shown a mass of evidence proving that the cops and the media had to either be idiots or conspirators to have ever believed that these spectacular hits were one-man operations. We have learned from these books that Oswald was a scapegoat, Ray a patsy, and Sirhan an OTO cultist. And we learn of their numerous, nay, legion accomplices. If you carefully study the scenario, what you'll find is astonishing. You'll find that the after-the-fact revelations are as much a part of the assassination plot as the initial cover-up. It's a deliberate, psychological process, they are taking us through a psychodrama of enormous scale, but not really different from the principle behind that pas de arm of René d'Anjou, behind the anonymous circulation of the Rosicrucian manifestos of the early 17th century with those mocking hints of identity contained within them. We are seeing it again now in the case of Son of Sam and David Berkowitz in New York. And this, by the way, will be our lead story in the upcoming October issue of Focus Newsletter, for those of you who are subscribers. 
A decade ago, David Berkowitz was presented as the lone nut solely responsible for the Son of Sam reign of terror between 1976 and 1977. Now, in a book that is as important as the Grant, Temple, and Knight books, a new book from reporter Maury Terry called The Ultimate Evil completely exposes the collusion between the media and the police. Well, I shouldn't say completely, but he exposes some of the collusion between the media and the police in covering up the fact that Berkowitz was not alone. He was a member of a cult which provided son, some of the Son of Sam triggermen, a cult which used black arts as a front for its narcotics and snuff films and worse. But it's been 10 years. The trail is cold. Maury Terry, the author, sidesteps a few crucial things, distracts attention away from a few others. In none of these cases have any indictments been returned or any of the dozens of perpetrators involved in these spectacular murders convicted or punished. So what does it work here? Why would the conspirators want their secrets revealed after the fact, even if it is years after? To answer this question thoroughly, one has to have a sense of the zeitgeist which our overseers in the cryptocracy have partly manufactured and partly tailed their operations to coincide with, because there is a spirit of the age, and many of the people in the right have never been able to understand that or coordinate their operations with that spirit, and that spirit does indeed vary. Secrets of this magnitude were seldom revealed in the past because the population had not yet completed the process. To make such perverse revelations to an unprocessed, healthy and vigorous population, possessed of willpower and memory and an intense interest in their own survival, would not have been a good thing for the conspirators. It could have proved fatal for the cryptocracy. But to reveal these secrets to a people who have no memory, no willpower, and no interest in their own fate, except insofar as it may serve as momentary titillation and entertainment, actually strengthens the enslavement of such a people. The component of the mockery of the victim as a show of macabre arrogance, when done in a veiled or symbolic fashion, and eliciting no significant response of opposition from that victim is one of the most efficacious techniques of psychological warfare. For within this horrific nose-thumbing, this perverse jest and clowning, is the issue of consent. Now, it's one thing for the media, the police, the judiciary, and the killers themselves to commit these terrible actions without our knowledge and consent. It's quite another matter in the realm of psychological control, public ritual, and psychodrama when these crimes are perpetrated with our consent. And it is an ancient rule of both the moral and the common law that silence connotes assent. Silence and an action constitute consent in the face of these crimes. They brag to us about what they've gotten away with, and we're thrilled by it. That's our only response. It's thrilling. That and the wait for the next thrill. This is collective suicide, of course. <clears throat> this is why the general principle of exposing the conspirators, when blindly applied, is bankrupt. Exposure, per se, without a strategy, is worse than useless. It actually plays into the hands of the conspirators. And by the way, to whom are you making this exposure? Exposure presupposes an audience of human beings who will fight, react, remember. I remember Bud Dwyer's suicide on television. The Pennsylvania official prefaced that televised act with a quote from his associates who told him that, Bud, if you try to expose the wrongdoing, the American people have become so jaded about routine investigations into political co corruption on TV's 60 Minutes in 2020, it's no use. So Dwyer decided that a population so jaded would need a sacrificial victim to shake it out of its slumber and its stupor. But Dwyer's televised self-immolation did no such thing, did it? Instead, it became, like virtually everything else that appears on television, a trivialized part of the entertainment extravaganza and very little more. 
It merely raised the stakes for the next human life to exceed in terms of violence and horror and brutalization as public fair. As I stated at the outset, I do not share the conceit about modern man being the best and the brightest human in history. I believe we have devolved, if anything, and while modern man is stuffed full of a tremendous amount of data of varying degrees of inanity, he is actually approaching the level of the subhuman. I submit that this process is the result of the imposition of a carefully orchestrated process of human alchemy wrought through public events which our controllers would like us to believe have nothing to do with mass psychology and everything to do with merely work-a-day buying and selling civics, politics, political science, and money changing. Well, perhaps it is that the elite are mad. Perhaps that's all they are. But if they are mad, and they really do believe in their own hallucinations, then we may still wish to pay attention to these, to see what form these have taken and will take. Because these mad would-be shepherds and controllers have method in their madness and a great deal of power. They may be found in the boardrooms of our corporations, our Pentagon, our White House. Take a brief break. <laughs> Fabled alchemy Yeah, just turn it over, Manfred. <coughs> Fabled alchemy had three goals to accomplish before the total decay of matter. The total breakdown we are witnessing all around us was fulfilled. Before I enumerate these, remember, I'm talking here about what the elite believe, the madness that they believe. And because they are powerful, the importance of explicating that, not what I believe. So alchemy had three goals to accomplish before the total decay of matter, the total breakdown we're witnessing was accomplished. And these are, one, the creation and destruction of primordial matter. Two, the killing of the divine king. And third, the bringing of prima materia to prima terra. Since this cycle of time was first reborn, these were the goals of the Gnostic, Rosicrucian, Masonic, Hermetic elite an elite not confined to hereditarily insane Roderick Osher type mansions in New England, but as real and corporeal as the Skull and Bones organization at Yale University, to which George Bush is a charter member. The Bohemian Grove here in California. Dr. John Whiteside Parsons Ordo Templi Orientis, also of California. Dr. Parsons, by the way, being of Caltech. General Albert Pike's Scottish and Palladian rites of Freemasonry in the American South, and a host of lesser imitators, all these cults having the highest possible offices, connections, and old boy networks. So let us give old Scratch his due. His minions accomplished these fabled alchemical goals with a degree of efficiency and panache that we must admire as long as we don our pathologists' aprons and gloves before doing that. The creation and destruction of primordial matter was accomplished at the Kabbalistic White Head, at White Sands, New Mexico, at the Trinity site, at the beginning of the ancient road known as the Jornada del Muerto, or Journey of Death, when the first atomic bomb was exploded. That's the creation and destruction of primordial matter in alchemy. The killing of the divine king, was ritualistically accomplished on the 33rd degree of parallel latitude near the Trinity River and the Triple Underpass on a street known to the people as Bloody Elm Street in an area known as Dealey Plaza, the site of the first Masonic Temple in Dallas with the shattering 
of the head of the King of Camelot, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And the bringing of Prima Materia to Prima Terra was accomplished in 1969 with the Apollo flight to the moon and the returning to Earth of moon rocks which have gone on to be used in various rituals of no mean significance. By the way, the Phoenix landing module was jettisoned into the sun in a kind of alchemical marriage of sun and moon. A Freemason and astronaut Lieutenant Colonel Edwin A. Buzz Aldrin brought with him to the moon the two-headed eagle flag of the Knights Templar, which is now on display at the Masonic Lodge in Washington, D.C. The final objective, after these three have been realized, the fabled goal of the Western mystery religion is known in alchemy as must be. It is also known as the revelation of the method. It is also known as the making manifest of all that is hidden. It is a process we are in now. Could it be possible in our wildest imaginings that the cryptocracy has issued a kind of video Rosicrucian manifesto revealing exactly what television is doing to us? And more than that, what the future of television and video and computers and electronic stimulation of the brain are and are being planned for us. The name of the film is entitled Videodrome, directed by the Canadian David Cronenberg. Mr. Cronenberg has made two other films of note. One, Scanners, is, a is about a team of assassins. And another is a version of a Stephen King novel, which also encourages assassination of a candidate for political office. The following are direct quotes from Cronenberg's film Videodrome, which pits a cable TV independent who broadcasts sadomasochistic snuff films against a mysterious global corporation called Spectacular Optical. Quoting now from Videodrome, we are entering savage new times. Quote from Videodrome, the battle for the mind of North America will be fought in the video arena, the Videodrome. Quote from Videodrome, your reality is already half hallucination. If you're not careful, it will become total hallucination. Quote from Videodrome, massive doses of Videodrome signal will ultimately create a new outgrowth of the brain which will produce and control hallucination to the point that will change human reality. In another scene, the movie shows the cable TV producer being fit with a flight simulation helmet similar to the one developed for the U.S. Air Force pilots by Thomas Furness, head of the helmet research program at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. The Wright-Patterson model, by the way, directs missiles by the direction of the helmet the pilot is facing, and you saw a demonstration of that in the U.S. attack on Libya, as you may recall. However, the prototype models, such as the one depicted in Videodrome, will feature a helmet that is really a mini movie theater, where the wearer is surrounded by a three-dimensional pictorial and audio display of the outside world, day or night. This display will be augmented by remote cameras that will feed pictures to the helmet wearer. In the dialogue of the Videodrome film, the helmet wearer asks his captor, who is forcing him to wear it, quote, will it hurt you? To which his captor replies, it won't hurt you. You might catch yourself sliding in and out of the hallucinatory state after this is all over. If you do, just relax and enjoy it. It will soon go away. But for now, I think you'll find a little video sadomasochism, ultraviolence, will be necessary to trigger off a good healthy series of hallucinations. That's why our Videodrome show is so strange something to do with the effects of the exposure to violence on the central nervous system. It opens up receptors in the brain and the spine, and that allows the videodrome signal to sink in." End quote. Researcher William Grimstad writes, quote, it is the implantation of this illusory picture of the world into our minds, a process of widespread, indeed virtually universal hallucination emerging from extremely circumscribed and elusive sources that forms the major activity of the hidden powers." End quote. Ronald M. McRae, writing the book Mind Wars from St. Martin's Press, 
declared that for the past 30 years, the Central Intelligence Agency, the departments of the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, as well as NASA and the Defense Intelligence Agency, have been deeply involved in occult and parapsychic research. McRae estimated the Pentagon spent $6 million on research to determine if the human brain can receive or transmit ELF, or extremely low frequency, ELF, radio waves. C.B. Baker, writing in the September 1987 issue of Youth Action News, cites ELF pulses in the 6 hertz range as capable of producing extreme disorientation, stress, abulia, and the disruption of thinking processes. Dr. Russell Targ, a physicist with expertise in lasers, optics, and microwaves, working for a decade at SRI International on what he describes as a multi-million dollar program of psychic research financed by the Department of Defense and U.S. intelligence agencies, said a major portion of his work dealt with the interface between the brain and the computer, bionic implants, and the creation of greater man-machine hookups. In December of 1984, Cayman Tempo, an industrial research organization based in Alexandria, Virginia, sponsored a private gathering of scientists conducting experiments in radical mind control. Among the 11 speakers at the two-day conference were Dr. Robert Yon, Dean of Engineering at Princeton University, Dr. Harold Putoff of SRI International, and Dr. Robert Morris of Syracuse University. The conference was attended by top government and military officials. In late 1968, the Federal Bureau of Investigation sent out anonymous messages using occult and mystical symbolism to persons who had been under FBI surveillance, according to the November 23, 1977 issue of the Torrance Daily Breeze. Our surveillance society, which boasts NASA's $189 million infrared astronomical satellite, which is capable of reading a car license plate from 560 miles above the Earth, leaves fewer and fewer private areas for the individual to find refuge inside. Electronic and laser technology are capable of reducing half a million acres of landscape to the dimensions of a video game for remote viewing. And I'm sure in one or two years that area will be doubled or quadrupled. These are the major methods of altering or controlling human behavior. The first is psychological, the second pharmacological, and the third electronic. In 1964, then-Deputy CIA Director Richard Helms reported to the Central Intelligence Agency on Soviet behavior modification and population control mechanisms. Now keep in mind as we review this material that at one point in his report, Helms states that the U.S. government is five years ahead of the Soviets in this area. So I'm not just showing you this in order to do some Soviet bashing here. I'm also showing you this as a mirroring. What Helms is talking about with regard to the Soviets, we already possess, if you can believe Helms. By the way, this was a confidential report declassified in the mid-1970s. Says Helms, with regard to mass mind control, quote, particularly notable are attempts to use modern information theory using information inputs as causative agents rather than chemical agents. This is a reference to what the FBI calls psycholinguistics. They have experts in this field. People are devoted to nothing more than psycholinguistics, what the Soviets call information inputs as causative agents, and which was known in the Western Hermetic tradition as twilight language, which was represented in Freemasonry in the personification of a very strange lodge character known as Dr. Syntax. It works on the same principle as the implantation of subliminal macabre skulls and other sex and death sigils in the ice cubes in the whiskey ads, which Dr. Wilson Brian Key has documented. And in the conscious, the conscious mind misses them, but the subconscious does not. Helms is referring to what the U.S. government calls the second signal system, whereby certain keywords recognized by the unconscious as words of power capable of generating sensations of fight or flight, terror, apprehension, and so forth, when these words are tied into scenarios, rituals, ceremonies, lone nut killings that are highly publicized, the process is continued. For example, in Son of Sam, you had a very strange letter written to uh, Jimmy Breslin, which I feel the cult knew ahead of time Breslin would give maximum publicity to. 
and they sprinkled some of these onomatological words of power, psycholinguistics, if you have to have the modern scientific jargon for it. And one of those was King Wicker. It was very interesting that that word happened to uh, crop up. Time limitations forbid me to go into that, but uh, if you make a study of uh, sacrifices and uh, ritual murders, you'll find King Wicker and Wicker cropping up repeatedly. Helms continues, current research indicates that the Soviets are attempting to develop a technology for controlling the development of behavioral patterns in accordance with politically determined requirements of their system. Furthermore, the same technology can be applied to more sophisticated approaches to the coding of information for transmittal to population targets in the battle for the minds of men. Some of the more esoteric techniques, such as the Soviets call it, biological radio communication, and this is Helm speaking, are receiving some overt attention, end quote. Helms adds that the trend in Soviet mind control was towards cybernetics, the use of machines as control mechanisms. You should also be aware that Helms states, and I want to emphasize this sentence, quote, there is no evidence that the Soviets have any techniques or agents capable of producing particular behavior patterns which are not available in the West, end quote. In other words, what Helms is reporting about the Soviets is old hat here. According to researcher Walter Bauert, the term cyborg was coined, coined in the mid-60s by C. Maxwell Cade and was first used to describe a human body or other organism which, whose functions are taken over by various electronic or electrochemical devices. Bauer continues, quote, it soon became clear to the cryptocracy that electronic brain stimulation held the greatest promise for specific selective mind control. Electronic stimulation of the brain when used in conjunction with psychosurgery and behavior modification offered unlimited possibilities. Human experimentation was undertaken in quest of the most reliable and absolute method of remote control of the mind. At the outset of this paper, I describe the condition of modern man as that of a guinea pig forced to reside within the confines of a gigantic open air alchemical mind control laboratory. That's quite an enormous statement. I'd like to document that for you. A powerful radio signal that may be affecting human health has been monitored in several Eugene, Oregon locations and in the air 3,000 feet above the city, proclaimed the Eugene Register Guard on March 26, 1978. The source of the radio signal is unknown. Thus did Eugene, Oregon become the first major population center to suffer the effects of electronic, check that, electromagnetic biohazards. Shortly before the register guard printed the story, a middle-aged Eugene man named Walter Deposky came down with symptoms remarkably similar to those attributed to microwave sickness. He noted a strange vibration emanating from within his home. He heard voices, he could not sleep, he suffered burning of the cornea portion of the eye. University of Oregon industrial hygienist Marshall Van Ert called upon to investigate Deposky's complaints found that Ert found that he suffered the same symptoms while in the man's home, the investigator. Disturbed, Van Ert recruited several local engineers to investigate. The engineers measured an unusual radio signal which they determined to be capable of producing potential biohazards. After unsuccessfully dogging public health agencies to investigate the matter further, Van Ert broke the stories in the newspapers. The Eugene signal was described as a radio frequency pulse at 4.75 megahertz. It was recorded within at least two homes and at 3,000 feet above the city as well. The signal strength was rated at 500,000 watts, 10 times the FCC radio license limit. The signal extended as far as way as the next town in Corvallis. After receiving 150 documented complaints about the signal, Governor Bob Straub, Senator Mark Hatfield, and Congressman Jim Weaver were prompted to demand an Environmental Protection Agency investigation. A data analysis by the State Health Department's Radiation Control Section determined that there was probable cause linking the complaints to the strange frequency. Said Clifford Schrock, a Textronic Incorporated radio frequency analyst who had written electronics, electronics manuals for the CIA and the National Security Agency, I was surprised. I'd never seen anything like it before. The people of Eugene, Oregon began to learn about EMR, electromagnetic radiation biohazards, in a hurry. 
No one, however, could get to the bottom of Eugene's problem. The FCC's Enforcement Division Assistant Chief, Richard Smith, flatly attributed the frequency to a naval transmitter at Dixon, California, nicknamed the Dixon Duck. Van Erd and others disputed this conclusion. The Navy denied that the Dixon Duck was responsible. When the EPA technicians finally arrived, however, they proclaimed that the mysterious signal didn't exist at all. Van Ert, Schrock, and others who had felt the signal and measured it strongly disagreed with them. But the EPA investigators held a press conference at which they discredited the reports of the strange Eugene signal and promptly returned to their Las Vegas headquarters where they refused to speak to reporters. After this, the investigation folded. The Eugene signal remains an official mystery. Although the people of Eugene, Oregon didn't know it, but the U both the U.S. and Soviet military have been working for years to perfect the use of electromagnetic frequencies as lethal psychological, not just physical, psychological weapons. Similar symptoms reported in such places as Timmins and Kirkland Lake in Canada were traced to a notorious Soviet radio broadcast dubbed by amateur radio operators the Woodpecker. These effects bear a strong resemblance to the biohazards inherent in invisible weapons like the electromagnetic pulse under development by both the Pentagon and the Soviet Union. Some of you may be familiar with that. That supposedly has the ability to disable all electronic communications and equipment in the target country. On October 14, 1976, radio communications throughout the globe were disrupted by powerful radio waves emanating from the Soviet Union. The broadcasts appeared irregularly and varied between very high and very low frequencies. When the US, Canada, Great Britain, and the Scandinavian countries protested the broadcast, the Soviets apologized, blaming the disturbance on unnamed experiments. After this, the nature of the wavelengths changed and huge electromagnetic standing waves formed, thousands of miles long, penetrating the Earth and extending into the ionosphere. Because of its characteristic sound, the signal was dubbed the woodpecker. The sound which ham radio operators heard all over the world sounded like the tapping of a pencil on a table at between 8 and 14 times a second. The wavelength was traced to alleged experiments in the Soviet cities of Riga and Gomel. The standing waves accompanying these experiments stretched down both coasts of North America and along the eastern frontier of the Soviet Union. The woodpecker had been blamed for subsequent shifts in weather patterns resulting from altered trade winds. The change of winds created a drought in western United States with severe effects on farming and the U.S. economy. But the potential effect of these standing waves on human beings is cause for much greater concern. Just as the human body's nervous system operates electromagnetically, so the Earth has an electromagnetic sphere which, scientists claim, can be altered to produce dramatic weather shifts. In fact, the Earth's ionosphere oscillates at approximately the same frequency as human brain waves, making it a perfect carrier off of which electromagnetic radiations in the brain wave range can be bounced without any change of frequency. The relationship between the electro-nido-atmosphere, electro-nidosphere, and the electromagnetic basis of the human body can be exploited as a strategic weapon. Everyone has experienced mental changes and emotional shifts during changes of weather. Imagine the power open to those who, by flicking a switch, could control the Earth's atmosphere and change not only the weather, but the brain waves of entire populations. Both the U.S. and Soviet government know that a strong pattern exists correlating geophysical phenomena and political disturbances, health, and mood swings. For these reasons, the woodpecker signal alarmed the U.S. intelligence community. A raid against this astounding technology and the occult history behind it, against the backdrop of machine man, ritualistic assassinations, serialized terror murders, and the ubiquity of the ultraviolet video drone signal, which after all is nothing more than television, is the second law of thermodynamics. By this natural law, order tends to degenerate even the new order of the ages. Our would-be psychic engineers and human alchemists are well aware of the nearness of midnight in this, their cycle of time. Within their own script, the crowning achievement, the jewel in the scepter of their conspiracy, which they have managed to project down the distant corridors of history from the mists of time, by their reckoning, 
This checkmating move will occur with the rebuilding of the so-called Third Temple of Solomon, where now stands the Islamic religion's third holiest shrine, the Dome of the Rock. <coughs> Curiously, this is the goal not only of the fundamentalist Zionist so-called Christians, but also of the Masonic Order, which features graphic depictions of this temple and most of their critical symbolism. For this temple is itself the alchemical project in microcosm, the yin and yang of the Western mystery religions. On the one side, we see it supported by a pillar marked Boaz, representing the Kabbalistic Zohar, or Book of Splendor, as it is known to its enthusiasts, containing what they claim is the mystical knowledge of the hidden. At the other extreme, the temple is also supported by a pillar marked Joachim, representing the Babylonian Talmud, the rationalist, precise, legalistic, pharisaical aspect of this temple. It has been the power of the Kabbalah with its knowledge of the mechanisms related to the inherent illusory quality of the material universe, which has informed the hyper-rational, bureaucratic, Talmudic agencies which have executed its mandates. The transmission of this temple symbolism, this great microcosm, into Christendom, into Freemasonry, and now emerging in the egregious form of TV evangelists, this came about through the great Renaissance alchemist Marcilio Ficino's co-conspirator, Pico della Miranda. It was in 1486 that Pico went to Rome with his 900 theses, among which were the Kabbalistic theses. Recall that up until this point in the history of the West, the concept of man being subject to natural law had never been overthrown. Call that concept God, divine providence, or heaven's will as you like. It was understood to the foundation of Europe and even the dignity of man, which became famous as Pico's oration on the dignity of man, which became famous as the proclamation and manifesto of the Renaissance view of man and his position in the world, of the Renaissance magus, whose dignity is described in Pico's address. This magus was depicted as a lofty figure endowed with powers of operating on the world, of perfecting an as yet imperfect nature. Of course, these were not the original ideas of Pico della Miranda. These were Kabbalistic concepts. Pico had been initiated into this transmission by a Jewish Kabbalist who went under the moniker Flavius Mithridates. Historian Francis Yates, writing in her important book, The Occult Philosophy in the Elizabethan Age, states, and I quote, what can have been Flavius' motive in thus encouraging and directing Pico towards his momentous adoption of Kabbalah into Christianity remains a problem and one which awaits further investigation, end quote. Well, I submit to you that the answer to this momentous enigma is everywhere around us. Jesus Christ in the apocryphal Gospel of Thomas says, the kingdom of heaven is upon the earth and men see it not. Christ was referring to the natural order, the extravagant beauty, the very divinity of creation untampered. Arrayed against this has been the occult maxim that creation is not really divine or perfect, but it will be made so by the intervention and imposition of human brain power, the imposition of what that temple represents. That is the occult project arrayed against the divine creation, an insane egomania which has had to falsify human perception and control and distort our cognition. Their achievement has meant the destruction of nature and the buildup of an artificial world, as artificial as the chemicals in our air and our water and our soil, as artificial as the false simulated reality of the digital and electronic video computer universe, which millions of people spend more and more time immersed within. 
as artificial and false as the great hoaxes and impostures of the 20th century, from extermination in homicidal poison gas chambers and gas mobiles, to the veneration of murderers, usurers, and traitors to kith and kin as our immortal statesmen and heroes. We inherited a natural paradise, but men saw it not. An ersatz vision was implanted in their minds, the proper hypnotic belief, and people believed properly. Out of this artificial perception, the cryptocracy is rapidly creating a hell on earth. That hell will fulfill the last stage of the process of human alchemy on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, probably in atomic fire on the 33rd degree of parallel latitude. Now, I don't wish to be misunderstood as being of that species which welcomes such a scenario. I don't. I work against it. This speech is part of that work. If this cup may pass, let it. But there is a process that must be gotten through, in my view, and the destruction that is to come in Palestine will not be a final destruction for this planet or the human beings still worthy of that name, God willing. But it may represent the unveiling and destruction of that Kabbalistic force, which is not only insanely egomaniacal, but ultimately profoundly suicidal and unconcerned with the consequences of its own actions. It may also represent the dawning of another cycle of history. Their greatest insanely arrogant achievement may also mean their destruction, the consequences of which will be so horrible as to be the ultimate antidote to the propaganda and mind control of a millennia. Ecce signum, ignum caritas. Thank you very much. <laughs>